What do you see in this picture? How about another one? Or another? These are all shipwrecks that lie at different depths. And at a closer inspection, you see these little critters. What are they though? I first began my fascination with shipwrecks and ocean liners and pretty much all things the sea back when I was four years old and my great-grandmother showed me the movie Titanic. Now you would think for being a male, I would be more attracted to the romance side of the story. But what really got me was the opening scene of seeing the Titanic wreck just coming out of the ocean darkness. I've heard of shipwrecks before seeing the movie, but not with seeing them with such motion as the movie showed, with going up the bow and going through the hallways, it really gave me a really interesting experience when seeing it for the first time. From then on, it just led me down this rabbit hole of just finding out about more shipwrecks and transatlantic travel of the 20th century and just so many interesting things and I just devoured all of it as a little four-year-old boy. And actually, the look of a shipwreck isn't very eerie to me, but instead it gives me a new sense of reality. You see, when you look at a shipwreck, you think that was an example of mankind's engineering, and seeing it at the bottom of the ocean kind of fails that. It gives you the sense that we as humans were not really meant to be crossing the, the ocean. When talking about decay and shipwrecks, you kind of have to talk about Titanic. Over the 73 years since it sank in 1912 and until its discovery in 1985 by Dr. Robert Ballard, the Titanic was slowly decaying and it will continue to decay until there is absolutely nothing left of it. People before the discovery actually even thought that the wreck looked like this, almost perfectly preserved in like this time capsule-like state because of the icy cold waters. They were wrong. The wreck is actually, yes, in freezing cold water, nearly three miles down just off the coast of Newfoundland. But because of the freezing temperatures though, icicle-like growths of rust, called rusticles, now form on the ship. And in these rusticles live Halomonas titanicae, a completely new bacteria that is slowly eating away the ship. Ships are made of steel, which starts life as iron ore, smelting and processing putting energy into the ore, turning it into steel. Corrosion is then at energy leaking out, turning the steel back into rust. Exposing the steel to more oxygen, such as in shallow water or areas of a fast current, speeds up the corrosion. But what happens when a ship is run aground and wrecked above the water? Well, there's a ship to tell that story. The SS America was an ocean liner and cruise ship, and yes, ocean liners and cruise ships are different, just wanted to clear that up. She was built for the United States lines and launched August 31st, 1939, the day before Germany invaded Poland. She carried the name America for her career until World War II broke out, and then she was converted to a troop transport ship, the USS West Point. Then later on, an assortment of other names, the SS Australis, Italis, Nolga, Alfredos, and finally, the American Star. The name she bared on her wreck. She was wrecked on Fortaventura in the Canary Islands on 18th of January, 1994. In 2004 to 2005, she collapsed due to the very rough waves that caused more harm to the wreck. Before that, the waves knocked out her stern, splitting her in two, but left her bow still upright with a few patches down below exposed making her a very eerie and towering steel frame of America's once flagship. Since she was out of the water, the corrosion is much more different if she were under the sea. This is because the corrosion in this case is reacting with oxygen, much like I said earlier when I was talking about corrosion. And when it does react, corrosion occurs when most of all the atoms are on the same metal surface are oxidized, damaging the entire surface, essentially rotting it away until nothing is present. The thinner materials of the upper works tend to break up first, followed by the decks and deck beams, and then the whole sides unsupported by the bulkheads. 
The bow and stern may remain relatively intact for longer as they are usually more heavily constructed. Heavy machinery like boilers, engines, pumps, winches, propellers, propeller shafts, steering gear, anchors, and all other heavy fittings may also last longer and can provide support to the remaining hull, or cause it to collapse even more rapidly. Vessels that come to a rest upside down on the yielding seabed can be relatively stable, although the upper decks usually collapse under the load of machinery and fittings fall. Wrecks that rest on their side tend to deteriorate quickly, as the loads are not what they were designed to support and poorly supported hull gives away fairly soon and the wreckage collapses. When you scuttle a vessel on purpose to create more marine life, it is called an artificial reef. Shipwrecks act as artificial reefs to provide a solid surface in aquatic systems for many different life orbs to attach to. Depending on the microbial communities and surrounding environment, they may either contribute to the wreck's preservation or deterioration. Even within a single wreck, preservation and deterioration process may vary, suggesting that the microbial community may also vary. So what have we learned here? We've learned that shipwrecks contain a mighty amount of bacteria living within its steel framework. We also learned about the time of a shipwreck corroding in shallow waters with a fast current quickens the pace of corrosion and wrecks located in a deeper, more sheltered parts of the ocean are in much better condition. Now, I'm no marine biologist. I'm just a piece of toast in the internet. <laughs>